Microservices are one of the most popular architectural patterns nowadays. And in our next talk, we will hear about several different architectural patterns for distributed caching. I'd now like to give the floor to Rafael, who will tell us a bit more about this topic. Rafael, welcome to HipCon. The stage is yours. Hello. I'm Rafał, I came from Poland, and I'm super excited to be here. And I, I will have a pleasure to tell you about microservices, and especially about caching in, my, in the microservice world. But first, a few words about myself. So I'm a cloud software engineer at Hazelcast. Before I worked at Google at CERN, I'm also an author of the book, Continuous Delivery with Docker and Jenkins. And from time to time, I do conference speaking. But my main job is I, I'm, I'm an engineer. A few words about Hazelcast. So Hazelcast is a distributed company. And it's distributed in two meanings. Firstly, it's distributed because we produce distributed software. But it's also distributed because almost all of our engineers are remote. I work remotely from Poland, and, but we have people all over the world. Uh, we are also a quite small company. Like in, in terms of engineering, it's about 40, 40 people. We have three products. One is the most known is Hazelcast IMDG, which is in-memory data grid which is mostly used for caching, but it, it's, we call it cache on steroids. Second product is Hazelcast Jet. It's quite young. It's a library for stream processing. And the third product is brand new. It's Hazelcast Cloud, which is basically Hazelcast moved, moved as a service, as a, as a cloud. Our agenda for today is quite simple. So there will be a very short introduction about caching. And then we go, and we are, then we walk through all the caching patterns you, you can use in your microservice architecture. While I will be talking, I would like you to think about two things. First, which of this pattern do you use in your, in your microservice system? You must use one of them because this list is complete. And the second thing I would like you to do is to think can I change this to any other of these patterns? Would it make sense to evolve to another pattern for, for my system? So let's start. Why caching in general? Everybody uses caching. It's basically for two reasons. One is the most obvious is performance. Uh, we have a service which has some business logic. It's time consuming because of the database access, because of calls to external service. We cache the calls to make it faster. The second is resilience. It may be a little less obvious, but think about that your service can be down, but you can still return the cached value. So from the user perspective, it can improve the uptime. It's not for everything, but if if you think, for example, about Amazon recommendations, you can still serve recommendations even maybe this data is not 100% accurate. Maybe it could be better, but still it's good enough. So the user won't realize that your system is down. But what about microservices? So that is, uh, in the microservices world, that, that, that is a very simple, very standard microservice architecture. We have. A lot of services, they can be in different versions, they can be written in different programming language, and they use each other. Now the question is where your cache should be placed. Should it be inside of each service? Or should it be as a separate cache server? Or maybe in front of each service? And that is what this talk will be about. Let's start with the patterns. So the simplest cache possible that you can imagine is embedded cache. Embedded cache means that you use some library inside your application, and this application use 
use it for caching. The flow of this diagram looks as follows. A, a request comes to the load balancer. Load balancer forwards one, the request to one of the application web services. And this application web service checks if or I already processed this data. Is it in the cache? If yes, return the cache value. If not, then do some business logic, put it in the cache, and return the value. This business logic can be anything that is time consuming. It can be some call to external service or call to the database or some long lasting cal calculation, anything that is time consuming. So it's so simple that we can even think to, about implementing this ourselves. You could use in Java like concurrent hash map. So this would look something like that. So the algorithm exactly what we described. We check if the request was already processed and it's in the cache. If, if yes, return the cached value. If no, do some long-lasting processing. Put the re re response in, into the cache and then return the response. You could implement it this way, but please don't do it. Don't do it because Java collection is not a cache. Because it's, it has no eviction policies, no max size limit, no statistics, no billion cache loaders, no expiration time, no notification mechanism, and it's just not a good fit for your caching uh, for your service. We can do much better using some library. For this example, very good. If you, if you use Java, a very good example is, uh, is, um, is Guava where you could define all these parameters while creating uh, your cache. Another example is EH cache. We could even think about moving this caching thing one layer higher and not to have it, like not to write always the same code for each part we do, but to have it at the application layer in, the f in your favorite framework Spring or whatever you use for your application. So in Spring, it would look something like this. We, we add one keyword cacheable, and then each call to this method will first check if this ISBN was already called. If yes, return the cached value. If no, call a method find book and slow source. However, be careful because because Spring, for some reason, uses concurrent hash map by default. So it's better if you define your own cache manager in your Spring configuration. So coming back to our diagram. So embedded cache is, simply speaking, just a library inside your application. So one of the issues is that if you look at this diagram, these caches are separate. They are completely separated from each other. So if the first request goes to the load balancer and then the application on the top, you do the long time processing, put the value into cache. Then the se second request, which is the same, goes to the application on the bottom. You have to do this processing again. So one of the improvements to the embedded cache would be to have an embedded distributed cache. The architecture is still the same. We'll just use different library. Uh, and for this library, for Java, actually, Hazelcast is a good solution. I'm not telling you this only because I'm from Hazelcast, but it's, it is really, for, for this use case, it's probably the best one. So it's still the same idea, but this time, both caches, they form one cache cluster, so they store the data together. So no matter which one will you use, you go to the same you go to the same cache space. So we have the same example: request comes to the top first, then to the bottom. No problem with that; the value is, value is cached. Hazelcast is just a library, so if you if we stick to this Spring example, then all you need to do is to change your cache manager with this one line of the code, you have distributed uh, 
embedded cache. A very short demo on that. So what I'm going to do is uh, to run from IntelliJ locally two services with Hazelcast. So if we have exactly the same, uh, exactly the same application, it's a Spring Boot application with this configuration. And if we run it two times, then you will see in a second uh, that they will form one cluster together. It's Java, so unless you use GraalVM or some new features, you have to wait. Uh, and you can see that the first, first member started. And the, if you look to the se second application, you see that they both formed one cache cluster. And now you may wonder, like, how it happened that they discovered themselves. So in my case, it was run locally. So no problem. They used multicast to this, to, for the discovery. However, we provide a discovery plugin for most of the environments. So if you happen to use AWS, you just plug in AWS, and your Hazelcast will form one, one cluster. It will discover other instances automatically. If you do Kubernetes, like all people now, then we have the Kubernetes plugin. If there is no plugin that you can use, then another choice is to use Eureka. So you set up your own service registry and use Eureka for Hazelcast discovery. We uh, blog post a lot of this about this plugin. So if you are interested in details how to configure this, just go to the Hazelcast uh, blog posts. So we ended up in this diagram, so which closes the first pattern you can use, embedded cache. Let's look at the pros and cons. So the very good thing is this sim configuration is very simple in deployment. You, it just goes together with your application. Second thing is that you have low latency data access. Because what could you do better than running this inside, inside the same JVM? It's just you, you will not beat the latency here. And you don't need any ops team needed or DevOps effort to maintain anything separate because it goes together with your application. From the downsides, the management is not flexible because imagine that you would like to have to scale up your uh, cache. You have to do it together with your application. It's also limited to JVM-based application or whatever programming language you use for your web service because it has to be the same language to embed it. And the data is collocated with applications, with, which may not sound like a big thing, but actually for big enterprises, it's a no-go. Mostly if you are a really big corporation, they don't like it because they store their data together with the application. That's where we are in our agenda. So the, the next pattern is uh, client server. And client server is like, I think, one of the most widely used. It's kind of the database style. So your cache server is something separate in your architecture, in your infrastructure, and your application connects to the server. The flow of the diagram is similar, so a request comes to load balancer, load balancer forwards to one of the application services, then the application is responsible for calling the cache and checking if the request was already called. So if we compare this diagram to what you've seen a moment before, the embedded mode, there are two main differences. The first one is this part. So obviously there is some set Another unit that we have to manage, so we need some management, which is good and bad. Good thing is that you can manage it separately, so you have more control. The bad thing is that you need a separate ops team or separate DevOps effort. But another thing that is very different from the embedded mode is this part. So now the application uses a cache client to connect to the cache server. And 
if you think about it now, it doesn't have to be necessarily Java cache client. It can be any cache client because there is a well-defined protocol between client and server. So you can use any, any programming language for your, uh, for your microservices. And actually, it's a very common strategy that you set up one cache server, and then you have a lot of services written in different programming languages, and they all connect to the server. It's such a common pattern that in this pattern, you can use some alternatives to Hazelcast, like probably the most popular one is Redis. Or if you, if you already spend a lot of time in the IT development, then you maybe remember Memcached. Uh, so Redis and Memcached, you can only use them in client server because they are written, I guess, in C. So you cannot embed them into Java or whatever application. So the only configuration is client server. How to start it? In case of, of Hazelcast, if you use, would like to use it standalone, you just run the uh, script and they will form one cluster. If you happen to use Kubernetes like most people do, we provide a Helm chart. Helm chart is a package manager for Kubernetes applications. So with this one command, you install the whole Hazelcast cluster into your Kubernetes environment. How to configure client is, uh, again, if you use Spring, you change the cache manager to use the client and then define, OK, use Kubernetes, and the client will automatically discover caching cluster in, inside your Kubernetes environment. So there is no static configuration here, which is good, because this will just work. So coming back to our diagram from a moment before, since our cache server can be managed separately, it can be managed by a separate team, we can even go one step further and move it outside our organization and move it into cloud. Cloud is still kind of a client server, but, but very specific. So it can be even considered like a separate pattern you can use. But the idea is, is, is the same. It's just that the, this server part is not managed by in your organization, but it's managed by a cloud provider. So you don't have to worry about all these things. It will just be, but obviously you have to pay for this. That's, that's the downside. If we look again, at like if we'd like to go to this diagram and see how it would look like in the spring, uh, in case, again, if you use Hazelcast, uh, for, for the cloud you have Obviously, for Redis Labs, for Redis, I will show you Hazelcast because I'm from Hazelcast. You again specify a client, you give it discovery token, how it should be discovered in the cloud, you give it the password, and that's all. So, a very short demo on how to set it up uh, using Hazelcast Cloud. Uh, you can, if, you, if you're interested, you can go to this web page and create your account and create your free cluster. So if we go to this, to this uh, website, cloudhazelcast.com, you can, it's just a simple console, web console, as you can imagine. If you create on create cluster, then you specify the cluster name. You specify the underlying, underlying cloud provider and the region where, where your cache cluster should be selected some other parameter and create cluster. The, this is very important, this which underlying cloud provider you choose because of latency, and I will explain it in a moment. But now let's see, like our cluster is already created, so we can create, click on configure client and see the discovery token and the password. And if we copy this into our Spring application, that's actually all, all, all we need to, to do to get it, get it running. So you see, you don't specify any URL or anything. You, you, it will automatically go to this uh, public URL and find your cluster. 
So again, we start the, uh, the, our Spring application, and in a second you will see it connects to the Hazelcast, which is located in the cloud. We selected AWS, so it will finally be located on AWS EC2 instances. Our cluster had just one member. That's what we created, and it connected successfully. So pros and cons of the client-server and uh, cloud cache approach. So one of the things is that data is separated from the application. The most important, I think, is a separate management, so scaling and everything. You take care of your cluster. If, For example, if you happen to have too much data in the cache, then you just scale up your cache, not your application. And it's programming language agnostic. So you can use any programming language you want. From the downside, it requires separate ops effort, and the, it's higher latency. I told you we'll come back to these cloud providers, underlying cloud providers, because if you think about it, that is a big difference. In embedded cache, the latency was always low. It was the same JVM. But here it's different because we use network. So if we set up client server on premise, we have to think about it. It should be the same, the best, the same local network. If we deploy in the cloud, then this is also important. This use case was not good because I connected from my laptop to the AWS server, which is obviously slow, but that is why we use select underlying cloud provider, because if you use AWS for deploying your services, then you should also select AWS here, and then you can also do a VPC pair, pair, pairing on the AWS side, so that your application applications are in the same virtual private network than, uh, than, mm, than the cache server. So you don't have, you know, we are in this area, it's even r worse than the databases, because the caching area is the space of in-memory data computing. Here, if you use Hazelcast, you are guaranteed that your data is stored in memory for the performance reasons. So even like one network hop is a lot here. We are really in the area of really small, small latencies. That is why it's so important if, if you use, that's why we, we, in the Hazelcast Cloud, we provide like you, you can use GCP or Azure, because if you use Azure for your deployment, you should use the same here. And obviously the same region, because you don't want to your cluster to be in the US and your application in Serbia. Okay, that was the easy part. I mean, maybe that was the, not easy, but it was the most obvious because like embedded client server, you could probably sort it out yourself. This will be more interesting. At least it would be like um, something new. This time we'll use sidecar pattern, which is, uh, this diagram is, is dedicated, it's limited to Kubernetes environment because sidecar is associated with container-based environment, not only Kubernetes, but Kubernetes as uh, uh, you will see mostly this in Kubernetes. So a short introduction to Kubernetes. Uh, for those of you who didn't, didn't he, he, that don't know like the details. So in Kubernetes, a deployment unit is called a pod. And this pod can contain one or more containers. It usually contains one container with your web service application. However, you can, you can have more containers there. And these more containers can add some additional logic. Like, for example, this additional container can be a logging agent that will send all your logs somewhere. So you add a functionality to your main application. And this additional container is called sidecar container in the container in the Kubernetes terminology. So in our diagram, we have, again, a request comes to our system. It goes to the Kubernetes service, which is kind of a load balancer in Kubernetes world. Then it goes to one of the Kubernetes pods. 
and it goes to your application container, so the main container. Application connects to the kind of cache server, but this cache server it happened to be a sidecar container, and sidecar container, one pod is always deployed on one physical machine. So it's always localhost. So this pattern is kind of somewhere in between embedded mode and the client server mode. It's more like an embedded mode because you always have it deployed on the same physical machine. It uses the resource pool together with the application and it scales up and down with your application. So all the management is still bound to your to one to your pod, so to your application. However, if you look from another angle, the sidecar cache is more similar to client cache, client server, because the application can be written in a different programming languages, beca because after all, they use cache client to connect to, to, to the sidecar container. How it would look like in, in um, Spring? So again, we configure the client, we add a static configuration, but the static configuration is not bad because we always have it on localhost, no matter what you do. In Kubernetes configuration, we create a deployment with a template for the pod, and inside the pod we have two containers. First is our application container, which is our business logic, and the second one is always the same, it's just cache server. Pros and cons of such solution. It's configuration is again very simple because we deploy it just together with your application. It's programming language agnostic because you can use cache client in any programming language you want. And there is some isolation of data between application and, uh, and your, it's on the container level. From the downsides, this solution is limited to container-based environments. It's, the management, again, is not flexible because it scales up, down with your application. And data technically is collocated on the same application pod, which may be good enough or not good enough depending on your uh, security requirements. And the, so now the last architectural pattern, and it is something slightly different. It is different because so far, application was always aware about caching. This time we will put the cache in front of the application. So the application does not even know that the cache exists. This time the flow is as follows. Request goes to the load balancer. And just before or just after the load balancer, we have the caching, which is on the request level. And then if there is such, if the request was already executed, we returned the cached value. If not, we go to the application. To implement this solution, the easiest, currently the ma very mature thing is to use Nginx, which means that you usually will define either you will use Nginx as your load balancer or, and define it together with your load balancer, or you, or you will have two Nginx instances, one for load balancing, the other for caching. That is the configuration you have to add to your Nginx config. That is the configuration, yeah, to, you have to add to your Nginx configuration to enable, enable caching. Mm, the good thing is that you know Nginx. Everybody uses it, it's very well known, so you can rely on that, you can use it on, pr on production, no problem with that. However, Nginx has some issues, like it's only HTTP based, it's not distributed, it's not highly available, and the data is stored on the disk. You could use Nginx with some plugins, however, like for Hazelcast, we don't have a plugin yet. For Redis, there is a plugin, but it's very immature, so probably good for a proof of concept, maybe not good for production. But you, you can, you can try, tr try it. So 
Another idea is like if we combine this solution with the sidecar, so we will take one level higher this reverse proxy idea and create like a pattern that let's use reverse proxy inside the sidecar. Again, we are limited to, to Kubernetes environment uh, as with the sidecar. This time, the, the flow goes as follows. Request comes to our system. It goes to the Kubernetes service. It's forwarded to one of the pods. But this time, it's not the application that receives the request, but it is this reverse proxy cache container. And this reverse proxy cache container decides if I have this value and return it to you, or should I pass it to the application? So such approach in general, like application does not know about what's going on. It has some good and bad sides. So starting from the good thing, what is good about it? Let's come to our diagram from the beginning, a classic microservice system. We have different services. They have different versions. They use each other. They are written in different programming languages. So you can look at this architecture as a whole, and you can say, I would like to introduce caching for these two services. And you don't even have to touch the code of the services. You don't even have to do anything within the source code or even the binaries of these services. It's all at the configuration layer. In a declarative manner, you decide, I would like this to microservices to be cached. In Kubernetes, it would look like this. So we, again, have our deployment configuration. We have two containers, one init container. Uh, let's start from the bottom. So we have our application. This doesn't change. We have our caching proxy container, which is this thing, this container that will receive the requests and decide, okay, should I forward it farther to the application or no, just return the cached value. We also need an init container, init networking. And what this init networking does is um, normally it's the application which would receive the request. So we have to change the IP, IP tables inside the pod so that all the external requests goes to the caching proxy first. So it's kind of, it will, it's a configuration of the, of the pod. So if you look at this diagram um, and all this caching injection thing, I mean, we inject caching on the already set up ar architecture. It may, you, you may think about, yeah, I know this stuff, you know, this is kind of injecting thing and configuration, it's close to the Istio thing and service mesh. And you would be right, that is, that's the whole idea of, of service mesh Istio, you, that you don't touch the services themselves, but you configure with the Istio, it's about traffic and security, but you configure things from outside. And you know what, like Istio even has plans to introduce caching. So if they complete this GitHub issue, they, that you will be able to use it. And they're actually implementing this. So it will be probably available, like, I don't know when, but, but, but soon. But I mentioned, like, this proxy caching, this application not knowing about the cache has some good, but it also has some bad sides. So. If you detach caching from your application, there is one thing that becomes more difficult, and that is cache invalidation. If you look anywhere on the internet, what causes the most issues with caching? Everyone will tell you the same. It's cache invalidation, meaning when to decide that my cached value is already stale, that I should not use cache, but go directly to the database or go directly to the external service. So if we use the, if the application knows about cache, it can use some technique like in Spring you could use cache evict. So you can have business logic which decides where, when and not to use caching. 
However, if you use reverse proxy, then you are limited to some standard HTTP uh, things like, you know, timeouts, e tags. So basically, you are limited to some timeouts. So that is that is that may be good in, enough for your use case or not. To sum up, reverse proxy and reverse proxy sidecar caching patterns. So good thing, like the, the thing while you're gonna use it is it's configuration based, so there is no need to change anything in a serial application. It's obviously programming language agnostic, it's everything agnostic, it does not even touch your, uh, your code. And it's consistent with the containers and microservice world. That's what, what's going on now, you know, service meshes, Istio, that is, that is the, the direction uh, in, the, in the containers world. From the downsides, what we said, like, the, the, the invalidation becomes difficult, but also it's um, kind of a new thing, and there is, for this reverse proxy sidecar, there is no major solution yet. So I showed you, like, the Istio is working on that. That will be probably a good, good solution. We did a proof of concept, so we can play with this, but it's still at the proof of concept phase, so don't use it on production. It's rather, so it's like, um, still a very new thing. And as we mentioned earlier, it's protocol based, so which is not such a big deal. Yeah, let's let's be honest. Like everybody is using HTTP, unless you use yeah, unless you work at Google, for example, they use proto proto buffs, but all yeah, all other world use HTTP for for communication in your microservices. So we covered all the patterns you can use. So as a quick summary. I know there were a lot of them, so uh, I will not make any conclusion or something. I would just, as a quick summary, let's do like quick decision tree, which one you should use or you can consider using uh, for your scenario. So I propose like the first question you can ask is, should my application be aware of the cache? If no, then do I run it in con as a containers? If no, just use reverse proxy, if yes, Use reverse proxy sidecar as soon as it's available, but it will it will be like I think it will be a big thing like ne ne next years. If your application needs to be aware uh, of caching, then the next question is: Do I have a lot of data or some security restrictions? If no, should I be language agnostic or do, do, do I write run containers? If no, use embedded distributed cache. If yes, use sidecar. If I have a lot of, uh, of data, I work basically in a big, uh, big organization, then the last question you have to ask, is my deployment cloud? If no, use client server on premise. If yes, use uh, cloud solution. So that is how I would approach this topic. Like, obviously there are like a lot of details, but in, in, uh, this is a general idea. So as the last slide, what I prepared is some resources where you can read uh, more about caching. The first one is a description of how to use Hazelcast as a sidecar container pattern. Second one is this proof of concept of reverse proxy sidecar using Hazelcast. Then there are two more resources. The first one is about caching in general. It's a very good article uh, of my friend. And the last one is a very good video about a talk of how to use Nginx for HTTP reverse proxy. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rafael. Any questions? Hello. Hey. Uh, I have a question about updating cache. Uh, I have a particular situation where I have 300 bytes, which I want to add to a list, which is multi-megabyte list. Mm -hmm. And I have many that those kind of lists. So all key value storages ask to, their semantics goes like, get the list to my process, update the list, and push that list into key value storage. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I want uh, to have a code, custom code in a storage where I can where I can load like 300 bytes of data, and after those multiply lists, and the couch, the only caching solution which I'm aware of it is CouchDB. And I never seen a cache which is where I can deploy my own code, where I can, where I can do update within a key value storage. If you. Uh, so if I understood correctly, so you would like to have. Uh, update a big a, list. Yes, yeah, so you would like to add to key value store and a key value store like a, some object which has 300 which is, meg megabytes. Uh, 300 yes? bytes. 300 bytes, yeah. yes. But you want to update. A list of those kind of uh, you're asking for multi 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 map semantics from cache. You, know. you have a key which bounds to multiple similar values, and when you when you're doing put, mm -hmm. you are adding to a list, and when you're doing get, you're getting a list. But when you have a client store cache, you you need you spend a lot of time to serial this area as the uh, the list to a client to a process, and then Serials list back to a cache, mm -hmm. and in latency bound, as I have uh, millisecond count boundaries on my proce processing time, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm looking to a hazard cast, but I really I'm looking for cache which where I can deploy code. Yeah, it would be hard for me to answer this question. I mean, because it's like very like into it's still about hazard cast or other, but it's. Uh, very like performance related question yeah. about multi map. So I I can only point to the view to the target where you can ask these questions. You can ask on our like channel uh, uh, on the on the jitter which is connected to our Slack so we really reply very soon. So the guys who are responsible for the performance they can help you. But I personally I don't have an answer for this question. Rafael will be around, so you can you can discuss um, okay, later sorry. directly with him. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? No. Okay. Thank you, Rafael, once again. Thank you.